Hello, listeners. Thank you so much for tuning in to the Deep Dive Lyrics podcast. My name is Joel Crow. And have you ever heard anyone ever tell you that uh, music is like a universal language or even the language of the soul? Well, I'm here today to tell you that that is not true. <laughs> Uh, anything but I mean we in the in this world where we have so much communication between us it feels like we are more divided than ever when it comes to the style of music right whatever someone else listens to I mean maybe you're someone who can listen to everything and, and love it and more power to you if that's the case I know it's not for me it's difficult but I conceived this podcast because in spite of the world where we're so divided, I think that we can come together at least around good messages, good values. There's a lot that we have in common that we don't necessarily realize when we put ourselves into categories by, you know, whether it's by race or by um, interest or e political affiliation, things like that, uh, or religion. Um, there are, you, you know, music does have a special way of getting ideas across in a, uh, I guess, a poetic way that it can be palatable to a great many people, people who are across the spectrum on everything. And that is, uh, it, at least in part, why I conceived this podcast in the later part of last year, in order to bring you songs that I'm, I'm just going to do a real stripped down version of them, trying to focus not so much on the music and certainly not on the musical talent because I'm not that talented, but I am going to play this song for you on piano and sing it for you. And I'm not the best singer either, but that's just how it goes. The whole point of it is just to get the words out there to you. And then we're going to walk through the words. We're going to try to examine what was in the head of the writer of the songwriter at the time. And will discover possibly what the implications can be for ourselves. So uh, the song that I have for you today, I'm very excited to share with you one of my favorite bands for a long time. The band is called Emery. And they're a group that it just is so interesting. They are, let's see, they're kind of thought of in the kind of Christian music stuff, but not so much. In fact, they've really tried to separate themselves from that in a lot of ways, or at least from the uppity, um, you know, hallelujah, praise God kind of stuff. I mean, it's not that they would disagree with any of that. It's just that they really want to, they see how religion can drive a wedge between people and chase people away. And they, and, and I do too. The reason why I love them is that I want us to be able to connect to people and that's that's just the the only way to be let's uh let's try to use a similar language and try to understand each other that's what this band tries to do which is why in every one of their songs they have generally a pretty faith based message not, not always uh, some of their songs don't have anything to do with faith but a lot of their songs have a, f a somewhat faith based or at least maybe not based maybe it's a framework. It's just the way that they view the world. It's the way that I view the world. It's it's a, a faith framework perspective of the world. And through it all, they write these songs that are about the human things that we all experience, the doubt and the anger, a lot of anger when it comes to Emery. <laughs> um, they're kind of a, a post-rock, I've heard them called, uh, in that they're they're almost a mix between rock and sometimes screamo kind of stuff, which, you know, is not something that I'm going to be replicating for you today. But a great band. I hope that you, uh, if you haven't heard them before, hopefully you're intrigued by this episode and you check them out later. This song came from the 2018 album Eve. So it's the most recent song we've done to date on this show. And... It is one that, again, like I said, Emery has kind of a connection to Christianity, Christian music, but they made kind of a stir in the faith community because the cover art on this album, Eve, has uh, a little bit of skin that uh, not everyone is comfortable with. You know, and it's not, 
anything you know super ex- extreme it's uh it's not anything that would be you know super edgy if it were on a a totally secular album by like Led Zeppelin or anyone like that but it it caused a bit of a stir and they talked about a lot about it. they have a, a podcast by the way um go check out the the bad christian podcast uh that's a great it's a great name as well bad christian podcast they talk about all kinds of things talk about their music talk about life and talk about how they deal with stress and anger and all the human emotions that we all have and and how it fits into a worldview and how to how to make the most of all that anyway i have the a song here to share with you it's called safe and i don't know if uh, there's much more i want to preface it with like i said it comes from an album which is called Eve and that is a reference of course to the book of Genesis and the Bible <clears throat> the first uh, the first woman that God created was Eve as the first man created was Adam and so maybe before we even play the song I'll just kind of walk with you some of the kind of themes about what what you can find in the album what you can can find and what we can expect maybe in this song before we even dig into it. Um, so Eve is, what are kind of the defining aspects of Eve? She is one of the first creations. She had a innocent early life, right? She, she was brought up in the garden, in the, in the paradise, the Garden of Eden. And she was the one as as at least the Bible said, you know, all, of course, all this is in the Bible. A lot of people don't believe that Eve existed, but in the Bible, it said that Eve was the one first who was tempted by the devil in the form of a snake and took the the fruit that was that had been forbidden to them, and um, is not so much responsible for sin coming into the world. But she is kind of blamed for that. And I think that that creates a really interesting dynamic um, within the faith community, within how we view the world. So so this album has to do with um, those things related to that, the, the shame of sin and guilt and, uh, and feeling like you're responsible for all the bad things that have happened. And in in a real part actually having responsibility and, and guilt um, for for shameful things that we've done and then at the same time she's also known as the mother of all everyone else that came along so she passed just as Adam did you know she's not alone in this by any means she and Adam passed into their children the same brokenness that they experienced when they sinned the first time so there's a there's a real quick run of the story of Genesis for you. You know, chapters uh, one to three, I think, is the, the chapter of the fall. But anyway, here's the song. I'll go ahead and play it for you. And then we'll talk about some initial impressions. And then we will do the deep dive. We'll go through it line by line. And we'll see what comes out the other end. All right. Here you go. You could always see yourself in me. A brand new way to live vicariously I wanted to show you the world through my eyes But you had to let me go, just let me go so I could live my life to look at the stars dream of the days we would find something more somewhere along the way the smile left your face and life said it changed everything we used to look at the stars dream of the days we would find something more somewhere along smile left your face and your eyes fell the light that once shined growing down I wandered from the path 
that you chose for me. And I felt your hand slipped away as my eyes opened to see. Somewhere along the way The smile left your face And your eyes fell It changed everything You held me close in your arms And promised me you'd love me No matter what I would become It's your grace I feel yourself in me so probably the first thing that you'll notice about this song or at least the thing that I notice is that it is bookended by that one line right and you see this sometimes in well you see it a lot of times in songs you see it sometimes in movies and in books where you get to the end of this really intense story and something happens and a light goes on in your head and you think hey I've seen that before that's familiar where does that come from then you realize later on or or it might not be until the next time you watch the movie or the next time you read the book or the next time you listen to the song you'll realize it came from the very start this was something that came at the beginning it came at the end and sometimes it can be just a structural thing that writers do to let you know that things are wrapping up but more often than that there's a reason there's a reason right that someone is drawing pulling your attention to this thing and saying here look at this again take another look because i i want to show you something and and more often than not when it comes around at the end it has some new special kind of significance so in this case that line is you could always see yourself in me and since that's the first line of the song, why don't we go ahead and go on into the deep dive? I mean, we'll, we'll be asking questions as it goes along, but uh, I, I think this first line has a really strong idea that just about anyone could piece out. I mean, so we're obviously talking about someone... So the, the speaker of the song is either a either remembering himself as a child or could be as a student. We're talking about a rela- a relationship that is either parent to child or at, at least mentor to student kind of thing. And I, I'd say there's much better reason to believe that it is a parent and child relationship, not only because this comes from the album Eve, which as we talked about, Eve was kind of the the first daughter of God, so to speak, and then Eve was herself the mother of all of humanity. So you have that connection, but also just in the line itself, I mean, it's possible that you can see yourself in like a student that you're teaching if, you know, you're you're watching them go down the same road that you did and make the same mistakes you used to make when you were a beginner at something. But even 
it's even stronger when we're talking about a uh, particularly a blood connection because there is there are similar facial qualities right there's a, 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 a an actual resemblance a physical resemblance a you know they say the resemblance is uncanny right when uh, when the child comes and uh, grows up and looks like the father or like the mother but even as a baby you know, people are saying you know it has he has or she has your eyes and and your nose and 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 as their attitude becomes prominent you you see oh yeah <laughs> you kind of get that uh, burst of anger from me or um, the sharp tongue or you know certain qualities and attributes so so we're, we're talking about a uh, parent-child relationship and uh, since the guy singing this is a song in the original version as well uh, we'll just call it the son we'll say that the speaker of the song is the son and it could be could be a father or a mother that we're talking about. For the sake of argument, let's start out and we'll say that it's a mother. Actually, um, I think uh, so. I, I watched the music video or the lyric video, I should say, for this not too long ago, and at the end of it, uh, it dedicated the video to I think um, the the mothers of the songwriters. But um, so for the sake of argument, we'll start out and when we'll say this is a relationship between a son and a mother. He says. You could always see yourself in me. And it's a brand new way to live vicariously. Vicariously, what a great uh, word. That's a vocabulary word. That's your word for the day for deep dive lyrics. Go write it on your wall and memorize the definition and we'll have a quiz next week. No, Um, Vicariously, what does it mean to live vicariously? Well, you might know, uh, but it in case you don't. It means you're kind of living second hand. It means you're not having experiences yourself so much as you are kind of living through somebody else. So somebody else um, has a, a wonderful event happen to them and then you get joy from that. Even though you yourself weren't involved, you yourself didn't necessarily accomplish something, but you can feel proud of the success that somebody else has. And it can also relate to very negative things, right? It can be the pain that someone is going through, the the struggle that somebody else is having. And, and if you're living vicariously through them, you experience that pain, you experience that fear, you experience that frustration that they feel. And the, in the next line, you, you know, that, that can be a negative thing. Uh, it can easily turn into a negative thing for a parent to want to live so much through their child that they, you know, push them into whatever their dream was, you know, whether it's to to go into sports or to be a doctor or whatever. But in this song, we we see in the next line, he says, I wanted to show you the world through my eyes. So the the child and the son in this situation is on board with it he's he is loving this relationship he he loves the the security and the the hope and and just the relationship and the sharing that he gets to have with his mother in uh, in the the beautiful things that happen to him the terrible things that happen to him he knows that he's not alone he's not alone in in feeling frustration or joy or whatever it is that he's going through and he wants he wants to be able to to be that to her to be able to impart new life to her because uh just because it's that it's that loving relationship but there's always a but i wanted to show you the world through my eyes but you had to let me go just let me go so i could live my life and of course this is the very nature of being a child or of being a parent is that eventually the child grows up. Eventually, you know, you'll, you'll never stop exactly being, you, you won't stop being the parent necessarily, but the relationship changes, right? Because as you get older, as a child, as the son gets older, he gets his own life. He, he has to. It's, he becomes more independent and less reliant and he can conceive ideas of his own and he can walk different paths than the one that uh, the parent would prefer and uh, 
and he needs that freedom. It's a, it's an essential human quality to need that freedom from the parent, right? So then he's he's going back, but he's so we realize that the the guy who's singing this obviously is an adult and he's thinking of himself as an adult, but he's remembering his childhood and he goes back and he's reminiscing and he says, we used to look at the stars and dream of the days we would find something more. So they're looking at the stars as he's a child. He's remembering what it was like to be a child and to be with this person, to be with his, his mom, we're saying for the sake of argument and uh, looking up at the stars and dreaming about what those stars could represent, what they could maybe be pointing to. Uh, it could be some kind of paradise. You know, I, I heard someone once say, and I'm sure it's a, a pretty common, um, kind of a funny, childish Christian thought that you, you look at the stars and it's almost as if there were holes in the sky and it's heaven shining down through the black right? I've, I've heard that. Um, it's a, yeah, and it's an interesting idea, very poetic idea. Obviously it's not scientifically true, but, um, but it is, but, but the stars have always been something that are, you know, poetic to us that, that seem to represent something else. And, and they're intriguing to look at and to gaze at. And we love to think about, you know, exploring, space, exploring the cosmos, and it can also be representative of, you know, our exploring the future and our being excited for whatever the future has uh, to offer that, that we're going to, um, you know, dream of the days that we find something more, something something better than what, what we have right now, right? We're, we're looking to the future and we're hopeful that we're going to find a life that is fulfilling, a, a life that is full of blessing and comfort and and joy and intimacy so we we look at the star we used to look at the stars dream of the days that we'd find something more but somewhere along the way the smile left your face and life set in what does it mean that life set in well instead of instead of being hopeful for the future Instead of being super optimistic and thinking that you're going to find some paradise out there, some, and, and instead of obsessing over and, and thinking about this fantasy where there's some perfect life out there, you just, you just set in. You, just, you settle for what's there. You settle what, for what's right here. And then on that parent, that, that face of security and happiness and, and that, that had shared so much with you, it says, the smile left your face. The smile left your face, the, 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 the mother's face in this case. The smile left her face and life just set in. And he repeats that in a, in a, in a more intense fashion. That we used to look at the stars, dream of the days that we would find something more. Somewhere along the way, the smile left your face your eyes fell, and the light that once shined is growing dim. So the light could be the light of the stars, right, that we're talking about, or it could be the light in her face that's growing dim. As, as the smile leaves her face, your eyes fell. And again, eyes fell from looking at the stars to looking down, to looking around and, and or even at the ground in, in shame and confusion. We're no longer stargazing. We're just we're settling for life as it is, and we're understanding that it's not it's not great, and it's not necessarily going to get all that much better. This is what life is. And I wonder. Let me let me give you this thought before we move on. Is it possible that it's is it possible that the parent didn't so much change at a certain point? I mean, it's possible that, that she did, but is it possible that the parent didn't so much change as the child's perception changed or the, the child learned how to, he just became more observant and began to see, you know, when you're growing up, you, you don't think about, you don't see the struggles that your parents go through, but there's a moment 
when you are crossing over into towards adolescence and you understand you know mom is really angry or dad is really angry you know someone's really upset something's going on some and uh, and you start to feel the the kind of compassion that you hadn't before and again it might not be that the actual situation has changed this is the first it's it's just that for the first time the child has the capacity to to sympathize with that and and to recognize it and to understand that all is not roses in in uh, his parents lives so that 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 part is the chorus uh, at least i call it the chorus and uh, and then we go on to the second verse here He says, I wandered from the path that you chose for me. Which, again, is just the natural progression of what it means to grow out of childhood, right? But maybe even more so. Um, I think it is natural, but it's significant that he uses the word wandered. Because we certainly, as we grow older and we become more and more independent of our parents, we can get different ideas of our own we can make different choices we can have different values and we do we do have different values we see the world a different way than our parents did and we do things that they don't necessarily approve of and we start maybe to approve less of things that you know that they have always done and we used to just assume that it was the right way to do things and but but this isn't that right it, there's a difference between choosing a different path and wandering from the path that was chosen for you. And this is a, a really, really important uh, difference. It's, a, it's, it's really significant that it's not so much that the son here, that the writer of the song or the speaker of the song, we could say, it's not so much that he looked at the world and and said oh this is tangibly better than anything that i was raised with i am going to you know stop in my tracks and start living a different kind of life and i am really looking forward to being a part of this it's not so much that he that he willingly gave himself to the world it's that he wandered it's that he was was taken from he even says so then the next Part it says, um, I felt your hand slip away as my eyes opened to see. So again, it's the hand. He's he's not letting go of the hand. You know, kind of the idea of, um, you know, is when when you're a, a young child, you you hold the hand of your parents, and you know you you can get security from that. But when you grow older, you know, you stop holding your parents' hand. You stop having your hand held, and you start to live life on your own. But it's in this case, and in many cases, and probably I'd even venture to say virtually every case where the child was raised in a good, happy, safe home, um, that that hand does slip away. It's not so much that the child makes a decision and says, you know, mom or dad, I don't like you anymore. I don't want to be around you anymore. And I don't want to be under your roof anymore. It's, it's that you, uh, you slip away. The hand slips away as my eyes open to see. And what is he seeing? Well, all the pleasures, the beauties, all the things that I had missed. In a moment, I was caught up in the world. So he's going away from his sheltered, protected life of the past. And he is bewildered he's caught off guard he's it says he's he's caught up so again all of this language is totally passive it's not that he's choosing something else it's that he he had something that the parent that the that the mother it chose for him and then he's he's caught up by something else you know um he's he's taken away he's coaxed off into you know, the pleasures of beauty, things, um, 
you know, I, it's, uh, it's impossible probably to consider that idea without thinking about, um, the natural, uh, sexual development, right? Part of it is, part of it can be, and, and generally is, uh, a sheltered perspective of sex versus getting out there in the world and finding that anything is available for you in the, in the, in the modern world. And, uh, and it, it's very enticing and it, it's not necessarily something again that you choose, but it chooses you and it kind of takes you away. It kind of, it draws you away before you even realize what's going on and, and your hand slips away and, and, that's that's generally what happens in, in the modern world. So he's so he's been caught up in the world, and then we have the chorus again. We used to look at the stars, remembering back again to the days of being a child and stargazing with his mother. We used to look at the stars, used to dream of the days we could find something more. Somewhere along the way, a smile left your face, and your eyes fell, and it changed everything. So he's, he's remembering, I, I think, I guess the kind of the, the thing that started the snowball rolling, the thing that um, started him down this path was realizing that his life with, this, with the parent, with, with his mother, wasn't as ideal as he used to believe as he's growing. Again, he's acknowledging, he's realizing that she has struggles, that she has problems, that she is not happy many, many times, and that life is painful and difficult, and the smile falls from your face, and it changes everything. And, and it, it forces, it doesn't force you, but it causes us to run to things, other things, to try, to, to try desperately to get some kind of comfort, to try to get some kind of control, to get some kind of excitement out of life that we we used to be able to find just by stargazing but now it doesn't work anymore now it now we can't we can't enjoy those dreams as much anymore when it's put up next to the the garish vices of the city you know for example uh, for instance anyway um the smile left your face, your eyes fell, it changed everything. And then there's a new part to this course. He says, you, again talking to his mother here, we're, we're supposing, you held me close in your arms, promised me you'd love me no matter what I would become. It's your grace I feel everywhere pushing me into the unknown that I feel. So the, the first part of that is the way that I think any good parent does feel about their child is that they understand that there's a future coming where that child is going to be more independent, where that child is going to have a life of his own. And, and, and there is beauty in the commitment to say, whatever you become, whatever you decide, I will love you. I, I'll do my best to be able to love you. And it's that statement, it's that commitment, it's that, it's that um, unconditional love that creates the atmosphere of something called grace. Now, what is grace? Right? So he says, it's, it's your grace that I feel everywhere. So he feels this thing all around him and it's kind of a some kind of quality, but I think that even in even in the Christian world, we throw around the word grace a lot without thinking too much about what it actually means. I think the the defining characteristic of grace is that it is undeserved. That's that's the most important part of, of grace is that it is unmerited, that it's not earned. It is grace is a thing that gives value to a thing that doesn't have any value of itself. Grace is a thing that, you know, even o- away from the Christian world, and if we're looking at nature, you can say, you know, uh, kind of stereotypically, look at the graceful gazelle, right? It's, uh, 
it's it's moving with smooth and effortless movements, but it's not something that it that it had to practice. It's not something that it had to earn. It's something that was just a gift, whether it's a gift of nature or if we believe that it's a gift from God. It is a thing that it that was unearned, a thing that it just has and always has. And, and he says in this song, this, this is your grace that I feel everywhere. And it's pushing me into the unknown that I fear. The unknown. Where, where, where have we heard that before? Have you, have you listened to the other uh, episode? There's, there's a, an earlier episode we did called The Unknown, which is a song by a band called Sherwood. And you should go listen to that because it's, it's a great song. It's a, it's a great song, and it, it really ties in well to this because it, again, is talking about having to kind of leave your upbringing, kind of leave your home, and, and push into the unknown. But this song explores kind of a different facet of that because it's actually saying it's, it's the grace, it's something from the parent. You know, it's one thing, again, to decide of your own power that I am going to leave the land of my upbringing. I'm going to get away from the backwards, um, you know, closed, closed-minded uh, situation that I was raised with, and I'm going to go and I'm going to be all progressive, and I'm going to be all, um, I'm I'm going to be all. Uh, my own man. I'm going to be my own in control of myself and I'm going to use all things for my benefit and I'm going to, uh, you know, just be totally, uh, independent and yeah. Uh, it, it's one thing to say that and, and a different thing to say, I have been given the gift of unconditional love and it's because of this that I can and I'm going to always appreciate it because it means that I can explore. It means that I can go out into the world. It means that I can make mistakes. It means that I can go out into this unknown. And in fact, I'm going to do things that I fear. I'm, I'm going to face the things that I fear. I'm going to face the things that make me uncomfortable. And it is frightening. It is frightening to go and experience things that you've never experienced before and have to figure things out as they come along, not knowing whether you're really up to the task. But you feel as if that, un- that unconditional love means that you, you have the freedom. You have the freedom to go out and, and make those mistakes. And it allows you to face the world. It allows you to, to mature into a into an adult who is not overly cautious and and willing to take risks and take chances. So he's he's being pushed by this grace, by this unearned value. He's being pushed into the unknown and then he gets to the what we'll call the it's not it's not a bridge really. It's the we'll say the coda of the song. It's just the end part of the song. And he says, you, so again, talking to his mother, we're saying in this case, you played it safe. So the ones that you loved could have everything. You gave yourself when there was nothing left. So she played it safe. She, you know, what what this... um, reminds me most of is actually uh, the, the movie, the very old movie, It's a Wonderful Life, Christmas movie, you know? And Jimmy Stewart in that movie, he the first half of the movie is just about his life and it's about him playing it safe because he's because he's got lots of desires and he wants to take risks and he wants to go and see things and do things and live a wonderful life of adventure, but he instead plays it safe for the sake of everyone around him. He's he stays home so that his brother can, I think, go off to college or something like that. Or um, I think he ends up going to the army and stuff. But anyway, um, he plays it safe. And, and this is what a, what a good parent does, right? Because 
in the same way. Every every parent has those desires, and and especially when your your children are young, you're usually still a young adult yourself, and and you still want to see the world. You still want to you know um, go ex- explore the Amazon or whatever, or uh, do incredible crazy things, skydiving and whatnot. But a good parent makes the sacrifice of playing it safe. You played it safe so that the ones that they love, so that their children could have everything, everything that they need, the security and the consistency and and just a, a good life, just a good upbringing. And then at the end, you gave yourself when there was nothing left. So they risked everything. They gave. Every, they sacrificed everything, and then, and then gave yourself when there was nothing left. And then he says, even when the sky was falling down, even when the sky was falling down, even when the world was ending, even when, um, you could even relate this back to the chorus. And this is like this could be an allusion to when they were stargazing, right? They were they were looking at the stars, and now the world has taken a turn and those stars are falling down it's the end of the world this is you know this is all kind of figurative language and it, it's talking about that moment that you experience as everyone does when your world is crashing down around you and you feel like you have no control and 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 you can't take any more and all the frustration and all the pain and all the everything that you're dealing with is it feels like your life is over. He says, even when that's happening, even when the sky is crashing down, you covered me instead. You gave yourself when there was nothing left. So that that second part of that coda um, says a little bit more about how she, the mother in this case, gave herself when there was nothing left and put herself in the way of all that pain, of all the of all the the sky coming down, right? The sky falling down or the stars coming down, put herself in the way and took the brunt of that um, of of that struggle, of that frustration. Now, that's basically the end of the song because then we just come back around to the bookend where he says, You could always see yourself in me. So so this is this is the life of childhood and parenthood and it's obviously an extremely difficult thing it's not too surprising to me that so many people my own age and even younger are opting to not have children anymore it, it's uh it's an unfortunate thing I, I think in society but it is what it is and uh it certainly is reasonable it certainly is logical that someone would want to spare, spare themselves so much pain. You, you could uh, talk about whether or not it's particularly ethical, but that is, that, that is your, own, um, your own value and, you, and your own desire, and certainly um, people will do whatever they think is right. But there is another construction that we can put on this song. You've probably already seen it. You've probably already been thinking about it is that this is a really clever illustration to talk about how God is with us, how, how we as Christians believe that God treats us because he, he is there with us from the beginning and he's giving our childhoods value and giving us these, and, and we have these fantasies and um, beautiful sights of nature and we feel secure Hopefully, we feel secure, and uh, and then the moment comes, and there, this is the reason why I said when we talked about the first chorus, when I said, you know, the smile left your face and your eyes fell. Well, maybe it's not so much that that the parent has actually changed, but that the child's perception of the parent has changed. I think that this is the moment where if we're if we're talking about not not a son and a mother, but, you know, the, the son and, and God the Father, 
then there's definitely a moment in life where it feels like God's eyes have fallen, that God is no longer pleased with you, that God is no longer on your side, that he is, uh, you know, disillusion, or it can just be projecting our own disillusionment on a world that we used to think was, you know, magical and wonderful, and now we realize it's just all humdrum, and this is what we have to deal with, and we just have to settle for it, right? Life set in. And then, you know, it, since we are in our in faith, we believe that we are the children of God. All these things make sense. That all of this is a, a beautiful analogy for the way that we turn from what we once believed and hoped for and were excited about and and life sets in and, and we're caught up in the world and and we leave the the good valuable things that we were raised with if if you know assuming that this person was raised in faith then at some point he kind of leaves that and he gets caught up in the world and he wanders from the path that was chosen for him but he was given the freedom to do that he was given freedom and from what 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 was it that gave him the freedom well it's your grace that I feel everywhere that pushes me into the unknown that I fear. So the grace of God, uh, even even more relevant than the grace of a person, because it's frankly not person. For, it, it's it's frankly not possible for a human to really have that pure, unconditional grace, unconditional love, right? we become disappointed in each other very easily and and we can't rely on each other to always feel a healthy way towards us um but we believe that we serve a god who does we believe that god is the perfect father that he always looks on us not not that he looks on the things that we do all the time with approval, but that he gives us that grace that he says, you know, this is a thing, the value that you have is not something that you earned, it's not something that you worked for, and it's not something that you have the power to maintain of yourself by doing the right thing, by making the right decisions, by staying on the path that I set for you, so to speak. You know, your, your value isn't specifically in that. Your value is in the grace that I've given you that pushes you into the unknown that you fear because, the, again, the future is frightening and we do have to take risks and we do have to do things. And then it, it makes all the more sense when we get to that last part where he says, you played it safe so the ones you loved could have everything, right? Because, again, how is it... How is it... I, I mean, I guess we, we kind of talked about how it means, um, you know, playing it safe in the human sense, but it's not very safe for a human to try to step in the way when the sky is falling down and it says you gave yourself when there was nothing left. Well, a, a human can't really in the fullest sense do that. A, a person can't take on the pain that you're feeling even if they would want to. A, a person can't physically undergo your loneliness and depression and spare you that by taking it on himself or herself. You know, a, a father or a mother might greatly desire to do that, but it's not possible. It's not possible to take that from another human being. But we do believe that Jesus Christ took that sacrifice, took that pain, took that punishment that was due to us and when the sky was falling down so he 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 covered us instead right he he covered us with his grace and, and if that sky is falling down he stood in the way and he took the penalty he took the punishment that was coming down because of what we'd done our world was ending as just as a consequence of the way that we had lived and he gave himself. And so what I want to say about all this is that for him and him alone, that is safe. That is playing it safe. And 
I thought about this a lot because how does the word safe make sense? And it's obviously super important because it's the name of the song. So how do we square that in the parent-child relationship? Well, it's not safe for a mother, for a literal mother, to try to take the pain away from her child. And it's not safe for a human father to do it either. It only works. It only makes sense you need someone who is competent for that. You need someone who is powerful enough to take that pain. You need someone who won't buckle under it the way that any human would. And it's only possible if you have somebody who is all powerful, somebody who is the creator of the universe, somebody who created you and values you and gave and gives you this grace and, and doesn't force you to earn it every day, but but gives it to you because it is grace, because it is unearned, and it's just a gift. And then when the sky is falling down, and when you throw it all away, and you you wander off the path, and you go into the world, and you're caught up, and then even after you've thrown all that away, he, he covers you instead. You covered me instead of letting the world, of letting the sky fall down on me. You covered me instead, and you let the sky fall on you. And that is a poetic description of what we believe happened at the cross for Jesus Christ, that he, again, just took the punishment that was due to us because of what we've done and how we've lived. He gave himself when there was nothing, literally nothing left, nothing else that would suffice, nothing else that could take that pain. All right. And then, of course, it ends with a bookend. You could always see yourself in me. Which makes sense again to go back to Genesis. It said that Adam and Eve were created and 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 therefore all of humanity is created in the image of God. That we are all that just as a a blood son resembles his blood father, we resemble God in a but not in a blood way. I, I don't think that that makes any real kind of sense. We resemble him in our spiritual reality. That's a complicated idea that I'm not going to unfold all the way, but it's something to ponder over. I hope that uh, I hope that it gives you something to think about, and I hope that you were able to get through all of this stuff, even if you're not super on board with the religion stuff. I I hope that. It, uh, it's powerful to think about. I, I think that it, it, it is powerful to think about no matter who you are. And if you're able to get past the, um, the mythological block, you know, of, uh, of uh, ho- hopefully, if nothing else, what I'm trying to say, hopefully, if nothing else, you're able to appreciate this as a deep and complex and and super significant form of mythology, even if you only take it as mythology. Hopefully you see the value in it that we all have. And and um, anyway, hopefully, hopefully you think about that. And hopefully if you do believe in, in Christ, I, I hope that this was encouraging to you to hear this song and, and uh, kind of just have the gospel preached for a little bit. So that is going to do it for this week. That is the song, Safe, by the band Amory. And this song is a lot more straightforward than many of their songs. Uh, a lot of their music is really really much more difficult to piece out, although I think they've gotten better clarity over the years. Um, but they've also gone down more radical roads over the years, so... You know, on, on this album, on the Eve album, they have a song that's called, um, a lot of people ask me, the, the song is called, a lot of people ask me if we're going to cuss in an Emery song, which is a great name. Uh, and uh, as far as whether or not they actually do in that song, I will uh, not spoil it for you in case, you know, not that it matters, but um, so there you have it. That is the song. Again, make sure you write me if you have any complaints, if you have any arguments, if you have any song suggestions. I would love to get song suggestions. The best way is to email me at deepdivelyrics.crow at gmail.com. Thank you so much for listening. Um, 
you can always you know subscribe to the podcast it's wherever podcasts can be got and you could always uh, write a, re- a review for me on Apple Podcasts. That would be much, much appreciated. Give me however many stars you think that this podcast merits because I don't know if I think it's necessarily worth the five, but, you know, give me what, whatever you think it merits. And also, I would love to talk to you about your favorite song or about a song that you find particularly important. We can do that... If you live in the Spokane area, you can uh, come into my office. No, I don't really have an office, but you can come and, and uh, sit on a mic and uh, and we'll, we'll have a conversation. Or I actually discovered quite recently that uh, I can do a fairly good quality phone interview with this uh, stuff as well. So we could even just talk over the phone and, uh, and talk about some music. So send me those suggestions, send me those requests, and... Uh, get this uh, ball rolling thank you so much again for staying and listening and um, that's more than anything else I, I just appreciate your your uh, listening to this long I think this episode is a lot longer than um, many of the others so thank you for staying um, yep send me more suggestions write me a review um, and uh, let, let's talk about music in the in the days to come. Oh, next week, next week I am planning on doing. And since I'm going to be saying this, I guess I will be doing it. Um, I haven't really done anything in the in in popular culture from today. I've done some popular songs from the past, but I would like to start getting into things that more people are into right now. And there's not a whole lot on the radio that would necessarily stand up under this kind of criticism and analysis. But I found a song that I am excited to share with you. It's not super recently done, but it is still playing on the radio all the time. And that is a song called Believer by Imagine Dragons. So look forward to that. I will, uh, I'll be giving that song lots of listens and working out how to, how to do my own stripped down version of it. And then we'll be, uh, We'll be discussing that next week, and that will be a lot of fun. All right. Thank you one last time. Go and have a great, wonderful day, and I'll talk to you again next week. Thank you.